I'm excited to welcome onto the First Time Facilitator podcast, Jeffrey Shaw. Jeffrey, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Leanne. Thank you for having me. Oh, of course. Like, I, I love your podcast. I love hearing you on interviews. So it's just an honor to be able to talk to you oh, in real time you. and like dig into the questions that I wish I could ask you. I just want to start off by, by this quote that was in your book. It really sort of, you know, when you read a quote, and it just stands out. Um, you said, we don't let go of something until the benefits of what's ahead are greater than what we've been holding on to. And I just want to throw that to, back to you in the context of, you know, you, you were a photographer, you had creative warriors. Now you've sort of done this pivot to the self-employed life. Um, can you talk us through that quote, what it means to you and how you've used it personally in your career? Yeah, you know, it's... Um... I actually probably use that more often and, and it's been my experience in coaching other people, right? Getting, trying to get my clients to move forward. It's true of all of us. We've all had to do it. There's, um, there's always something we need to let go of in order to move forward. You know, whether it's an old belief system, the old adage in, in life and in business that, um, you know, what got you here won't get you to where you want to go couldn't actually be more true in the different stages of our life. You know, there's, there's things that we have to be aware of that with that, with gratefulness, we have to appreciate what got us here, but there's almost always something we have to let go of in order to get to the next stage, some mindset, or, you know, kind of ties into the, the notion that what works for us works against us. Mm -hmm. You know, there's ways in which what worked for us for most of our life to make us successful, to get us to this point, we suddenly realize it's that same thing that, or some variation of it that's working against us. And often that's kind of what we need to let go of, some old belief system, mindset, limitation, something that we need to let go of in order to move forward. Yeah, and, and the beginning of your book really does, it touches a lot, a lot of your book touches on mindset. And I definitely see that. I mean, playing out with myself, it kind of sucks, doesn't it? That, that what, you know, we've been so good at something and we've harnessed something that's got us to a certain stage that we then have to let go of. How do you work through that uh, with clients? Like, does it take time or is it they wake up in the morning and like, oh, the shift has happened? Like, what sort of process does it take to, to move yeah, I, on? I love that. And it's one of the things that energizes me the most about who I coach today. So, most of the, almost everyone I work with um, is, you know, we could say middle age, but of, of in that middle, but the middle age is just such a broad gap yeah. these days, right? Um, in fact, there's an entire chapter in my book, The Self-Employed Life, about people I call midlife self-employed because midlife is just so broad. You know, I, one of my favorite guests on my podcast was Chip Conley, who wrote a book called... Um, Wisdom at Work, but the subtitle, which I love, is The Making of a Modern Elder. So this big mindset shift I had about uh, middle age from Chip, because this has become kind of the scope of his work, is that the fact that we're living longer doesn't mean we're old longer. We're actually a midlife longer. We're still only old, like the last 10 years of our life, but we have this much broader spectrum of midlife. So most of the people I coach are somewhere between, we could say 35 to 65, you know, it's a pretty broad range. Mm. What's so beautiful about working with that audience, that, that client is that it is remarkable how quickly something can shift when brought into light. It's not the old work we felt like we had to do in our twenties and thirties when you had to analyze your past and how did you get here and how did your mindsets for, it is Every day of my life, as I coach people, it is shocking to me how when something is brought into light, it can shift almost instantly. That to me if it is the most optimistic thing to look about how we can build success in our lives because it, it can be so quick that you suddenly realize the thing that's holding you back, the thing that you had to let go of. It does, it could be such a, you know, as that old adage that life can turn on a dime and it is so true. I mean, you really can completely change your future, your current state with a single mindset brought into light that you now have control over managing. I, I love that you use the analogy of light, given that you, your background is in photography. And we also know how, you know, how quick light can be, the speed of light. The, um, that's actually very reassuring as well. So I'm 38 and I just think, oh, I've got to have everything right now. And I love that you talk about that expand of, of the midlife actually being a lot uh, a lot more broader than it was before as well. And what I hope, Jeffrey, is that people listening to this conversation, this will be their moment where the light hits and they're like, oh, something has been happening in my life. Maybe if I can shift it, um, other things will, will surface. 
Well, um, I think, yeah. you know, to that point, yeah. Atlanta, because because the nature of your work, you know, around facilitation and workshops, mm. one as a as a speaker and as a facilitator of workshops, with that idea in mind, what how I go about creating my events is I actually I start with what I call seven fundamental shifts. So I first come up because I reverse engineering is like the gift to everything, right? It's, yes. it's like your magic formula. So I kind of reverse engineer. I first decide what are seven fundamental shifts that I'm going to offer the group that I'm facilitating. Um, so I start with those. I figure at least one of them is going to land with everybody there, you know? And as you know, when we go to an event or we participate in a workshop, honestly, if we walk away with one big shift, we're happy. We feel like we've gotten value from that. Like I think sometimes as facilitators, we think we have to give people seven shifts. Yeah. No, it really, most people are so happy. If they walk away with one life-changing shift, be it a strategy or a mindset, they feel like they've gotten tremendous value. Mm -hmm. So I start with seven, figuring one of them is going to land. And then I work my, that's how, then I use that as my thread to create my whole event. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, because if with one thought, one thought, one change of thought, one change of practice, one way of doing something differently can make a world of difference for someone. And it's really interesting you say that because sometimes um, like I listen to podcasts or audio or read a book, right? And so, and, and when I read a book at a certain point in time, something really will stand out to me. Then I'll read it again three years later and something I just overlooked then is way more relevant now so it's all about that timing as well as yeah. you know someone might have heard that thing but then in your workshop at that time around those people it's landing it's like 100 percent, and that's why we need to keep marketing i mean there were, yeah. you're so spot on leanne there was a book that i cannot tell you how many people told me to read years ago it's called radical acceptance and everyone was this was like getting quite the buzz everybody told me i needed to read this book and I would look at the book, I would read, I'm like, I just didn't see myself in this book. I'm like, I don't see why I need to read this book. Like I am thinking I don't have an issue with acceptance. Like I got confidence and, you know, self-worth and all that. And I kept picking it up and putting it down until one time I picked it up. I'm like, oh my gosh, I am so this book. Like I so need this book. And that, you know, fundamentally, there's a really important marketing lesson in that because you realize that's why you need to do repetitive marketing. That's why you need to keep putting yourself out there, even on social media. It's why you need to keep your messages going because the very same person that you have not heard from in seven years on that day, you may have opened up their mind and their hearts and souls to exactly what they need right then. Mm. So I work with a lot of facilitators, as, you, as you've alluded to, and um, facilitation business owners. And a, I, I so I want to ask your opinion on, on many of these sort of marketing objections that they bring up. But just on that, that point of consistency, um, I guess what I, what I sense is that they think, oh, I've done like one social media post, uh, no, no one bought, like what's, what's wrong with me? And, and I think we do shine the spotlight harder on ourselves and we think we're, do, we're going over the top. But really, um, can you talk us through your like what it is about consistency how you show up the fact that you're on this podcast you've already got a book you've been on hundreds of other podcasts but you're still showing up today yeah. like what drives that and um what what tips can you give to facilitators who are like ah it's, it's a one yeah. and done thing it's so it's so great you're asking that because there's a couple of different ways like one is to have effective marketing it does take repetition what it takes is and i think your facilitators will really understand this concept i refer to it as big stake little stake Okay, so what I mean by that is, what is the big steak? Like, and I mean, I mean by steak, no, we're not talking about a piece of meat. I actually don't eat meat, but I'm talking about like a steak in the ground, you know? What's the steak in the ground that you're claiming this is my land? And so like my land, my big steak is self-employed. That's who I serve. That's who I help. I can talk all topics, self-employed all day long, right? That's the, I also, I also love to refer to that as platform. And I love the dual meaning of, of platform. Uh, so what I mean by dual meaning is a platform is both a collection of values and a platform is the thing you stand on, right? It's a piece of, it's a stage. I love the fact there's a dual meaning to the word platform. So your platform is your big stake. What is it? What is the big stake you're putting in the ground for which you want to be known for? That's your big stake, your little stake are the various books you'll write, 
the articles you'll write, the podcast you'll show up on. The key is those little stakes have to always point to the big stake over and over and over and over again. What most people do is they they start, they get bored with themselves, so they drift away from their big stake, right? But what's happened is you've diluted you know, your message and you've also confused your audience. They're like, wait, I thought we were going here. So it takes an incredible, incredible amount of repetition for you to stay on your big stake, stay on the meaning, your platform. The, what that introduces often, and I hear this all the time, as recently as this morning when someone is expressing to me, I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. She, she's launching a book and she's doing a book tour. And I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. And I said, well, I think, you know, I try to say it nicely. I was like, I, you're probably thinking you're a little too important because the fact <laughs> of the matter is, right? The fact <laughs> of the matter is people are, pro- no matter how many times you say it, they're not following you that closely. <laughs> So get over yourself, right? So, and I, the comparison I gave to her, which really resonated, I said, think about a popular singer, like a Barbara Streisand or a big band. Like think about how many times they have sang their hits. And as a fan, how would you feel if they don't sing that hit, right? There's an expectation that they keep singing the same song. We as marketers have to keep singing our same song. You know what? People don't get tired of it as much as we think they do, and they want it. And that's how we get our message across and make it a clear message. I love that. It sort of relates to what you talk about in your book about like getting out of your own way as well. Um, the reason I'm sort of laughing is because I I frequently just <laughs> talk about random things, but also um, in, in the context of workshops as well. I know, and it's not only me, a lot of me, uh, many facilitators, we, we, we hone a workshop, it's it's down pat, all the activities work, the icebreakers are perfect. Yet we're like, the next time we run it, we're like, oh, we'll have to change it up. Um, yeah. Even if though it's a different client, a different environment, but it's it's that, um, yeah, maybe I'm getting bored of it myself. Yeah. And, I, and you're saying it's like, if it works, like. Yeah, I mean, to, to me, the fun, Leanne, the fun mm-hmm. in all of this is being creative and figuring out how you can point every little stake to your big stake. So I posted on, on yeah. Facebook just yesterday, so I was writing, I write um, on ongoing, I'm a, cont- a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine. So I try to write a weekly article. So I was writing one yesterday and I was so proud of myself because I worked in an episode, a single scene from an episode from the series Golden Girls into a business article. And to me, that's, a, I get so excited. I'm like, okay, that was crazy creative. Like this is this crazy scene in the Golden Girls. I'm like, there's a business lesson in that. The point is, is that it's pointing to the same stake, right? People, when they read it, it's like this random, it's so random. I actually hope, I hope my editor doesn't cut it, but it <laughs> seems like so random, but it, it swings right back around and it points to the same big stake business lessons for self-employed business owners. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting bored with yourself or feeling like you're reinventing your content all the time, because again, what you're doing is you're diluting your message and you're confusing the audience. Instead, leverage your creativity to figure out how can I like take something from left field and point it to where it needs to go. I love that. I mean, that's like, that's pure, like it's innovation, right? Just connecting two really random things together to create something, to create that lesson. Just on the topic of messaging, um, I want to read this uh, passage from your book because again, I I sense it a lot and I do, honestly, I I think I do it myself as well. Like I'm not placing the blame blame on anyone else. You say here, I asked one client, do people often tell you you're polite? She said, yes, I've heard that my whole life. Why? And I reply, this is you, Jeffrey, uh, because I read your application and it's powerful. Your website is very polite and quite honestly, boring. Do you want to be bold and stand out or polite and blend in? Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is LinkedIn is a very powerful uh, platform for people in facilitation businesses who are marketing to other businesses. Yet when I go on LinkedIn, I am just scrolling through all the boring posts and everything that's been said before about leadership starting from the top and it's like uh um but there's a reason I guess why we sort of hold ourselves back do you want to share a bit on, on what you see and mm-hmm. why do we all just go look just, just do the ordinary why can't we push ourselves out to the edge it's something weird happens when we're putting ourselves out of the world we switch to some other hat and I think the people that suffer the most from this or is anyone coming from corporate 
or if you're in an industry that there is a standard of behavior. <laughs> so for example, I coach a lot of people in the financial industry. And I believe a big part of the reason why I get so many clients in the financial industry, whether it's bookkeeping or retirement planning or anything in the finances, the reason I get so many of those clients is because after they hear me speak, they realize that, as I often say, you are in one of the most emotionally driven businesses there is. Like, it's what people fight the most about, worry the most about, and yet you go to their website and it's so boring. How is it you can be in one of the most emotionally driven businesses and present yourself completely unemotional? And there's something that happens, and I see it on LinkedIn as well. I see it every day on people's websites where, and what you were referring to in that quote with the application is because I offer complimentary to do website brand message reviews for people. And it's an application process. And if anybody wants to get it, you can go to brandmessagereview.com. It's basically, there's a system to it. So you fill out an application. The application asks you questions like, what do you think are the top three values of your cl ideal clients? Why do you do what you do? They're coaching questions. I read the application and then I go to the website. And the reason I do that is because in the written application, people pour their heart out. I get a real sense of their passion, who they are. And then I go to the website and I'm like, who is this stranger? Like they, it feels nothing. And that's why I do it that way because it helps me see the division between who they really are and how they're showing up. And the reason for that is, is I think people feel like, oh, I'm working on my website. Let me put on the polite website hat. Let me put on the bookkeeper hat. Let me put on the industry standard hat. The problem is, is that you're not coming through. Your authenticity isn't coming through. Mm. I, I, I've come from corporate. So that's why I'm sort of nodding. Um, I, I completely resonate with all of that. I even find it in my email marketing. So like if you were to Jeffrey, read my emails, emails to my friends versus an email to my list, yeah. it's like, a university assignment is the email list version. And I really struggle to create it. I don't enjoy it yet. I can just fire off like really fun emails or like all these playing on words to my friends. Um, I have a great tip on that. If you, please, if you want, please, because, please. yeah, because I yeah. had to do the same thing. I'd have to say that's probably where I switch into some other hat is in my email communication because my background being a photographer, a portrait photographer for very affluent families there was a certain decorum to communicating with them. And I, I find that kind of drips over into my emails today that they come across more formal, more stiff. So uh, when I, for my email marketing for the longest time, you know, if my friends and family, they would, they would opt into my list for one reason or another, maybe they were opting in. So they would buy my book or what have you. But when I did my email blast, I had a filter and I would filter out all my friends. Like when my friends would sign into my email list, they were tagged friend. When I sent out my emails, I removed all my friends because I figured, A, they're not going to pay me for my services because they can get me for free. <laughs> and, you know, part of me had to admit, it's a little embarrassing to show up all professional like in front of your friends. And that is when I had a light bulb moment. I said, but it shouldn't. So what I did is I added friends back in because now I'm communicating with my audience as my friends. I'm realized, so then I was like, I don't want to show up as stiff bozo Jeffrey Shaw to my friends. So I started presenting myself more real and casual to my entire audience because I knew my friends were getting it. It also helps with frequency because that's something people struggle with all the time. How yeah. often should I email? Yeah. Most people I find, certainly the, the heart-centered entrepreneurs that I work with, they tend to worry so much about it, they don't email enough. Now, if your friends are on your list, it helps you with frequency because you're going to think, well, how would your mother feel if you haven't been in touch in two months, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So suddenly you start thinking, if you, if you think about adding friends into your email marketing, you think about how do I want to, do I want to, I want to show up as their friend, just like you want to show up to your audience. And it helps you determine, I don't want to bug them, but I don't want to ignore them either. And it helps yes. you figure out what's the right timing to make everybody on your list feel like a friend. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Like, and so thank you for, for sharing that because it is a mindset thing. It isn't just a tactical, like I could right now just write an email. I haven't sent an email list uh, in, in weeks, 
Um, and it's not because I don't know how to do it or any of the technology or it's more like that, what you were just talking through that internal resistance because of the messaging and um, yeah. So, and, and just showing up as well. Uh, so thank you for that. I want to talk to you about your, your writing, uh, the fact that you, you write every week, you keep showing up in that medium as well. Something that you wrote in your book that I is like, ah, oh, maybe that's what's holding me back is you talk about different work environments. So you'll have different spaces for doing different things. And I like, I literally have where we're recording right now. This is like the office. This is where I do all the work. And you actually talk about five or six different environments that you use. Can you just share that with listeners? I think yeah. it's so linked to productivity, efficiency, and just doing yeah, I, I love that I, I call it space switching and mm -hmm. it is honestly it's it's a productivity hack it has I cannot I'm actually shocked at how many people have read the book and this is the thing they latch on to <laughs> and quite honestly between you and I it was an afterthought in the book because the chapter it was supposed to be it was supposed to be a different chapter and as I was writing the chapter it was supposed to be I didn't like it I'm like this is for, so on a whim I'm like I'm going to write about something that I feel right. And I wrote it and it turns out as life often goes this way, it turns out to be like something everybody's really latching onto, but it's, it's a productivity hack that I believe works particularly well for those of us that have a tendency to chase squirrels, <laughs> I'll be honest, because what we, you know, I've always resisted. I think as many of us have, I've resisted the constant message of being told to focus, focus on one thing. Then you go into business, pick a niche. I'm like all of this is <laughs> sucking the life out of me. And I felt like the whole, whether from the, from my being a child living in a world where teachers are telling me to sit still and focus on one thing to that, you know, to, to getting older and, and maybe going into business and telling the business world, telling you to pick one thing, one audience, one thing to do. It's like, why is the whole world trying to make me somebody that I'm not? Like, why can't I leverage the best of who I am? So space switching to me really does this. So what it is, is, and yet I will admit that I am also a believer of science. I like to follow. And what we know of the science of the brain is that task switching is a tremendous waste of time. So if you're sitting at your one desk and you're switching tasks, you're losing a lot of productivity time because your brain has to wind down, wind up, wind down, right? So that, I believe that. I believe in the science of that. So what I decided to do is I have several workstations in my apartment. Now, I live in an apartment in Miami. This is not a palatial, so this doesn't require a lot of space, but I have a different space for different tasks. So I have my writing space, which for me is uh, a, a I stand as I am now, I stand almost all day long, but that is when I sit. I sit in a chair on a terrace, I live on the ocean. That's my creative space, okay? I have the space I'm at now. This is, I refer to this as my client space. This is where I do podcast interviews. This is where I coach my clients, right? I'm standing, It's my entire background is branded with the books and everything that anybody would need to know. Directly to my left, I have my admin space. It's literally just to my left, but I would sit. That's where I pay bills, pay taxes, stuff I don't like to do. But I enhance that space. I oh, When I sit and pay bills or have to look at anything logical, I light a candle, right? I shift the environment, mm -hmm. even though it's just to my left, I light a candle. So the, the, um, the goal here is to use space switching so that every time you step into that space, your brain is engaged in the task that it's used to doing in that space. I believe, I don't have scientific evidence of it. I have ex, you know, experience evidence that I believe that you save that, that winding up and down time of the brain, because when you step into that space, you're immediately engaged in the task that you're doing in that environment. Mm. And it appeases our innate need for those of us that suffer from that. And it, it appeases our need for a change of focus. It appeases our need for a different feel. Uh, it just, it works so beautifully. I have several different spots. I work in my apartment. I have different stand-up desks that are set up elsewhere and I shift, I switch space based on the task. So good. I'm, I'm actually, so it's Friday in Australia. I'm, I'm keen to go out table shopping and just grabbing some new, some items. And even just like you said, a candle that just shifts that environment through Correct. scent. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm always very clear on that. Like I said, I live in an apartment. It's not a palatial place, but you can do a lot by just shifting the environment. To me, I'm very, very, my mood is very driven by scent. 
So I'm big on using fragrances such as candles to shift my, whether it's a diffuser or it's a candle, using that to shift the mood of that space on what you want to accomplish. Any favorite scents that you can recommend? I like, well, I tell you, I'm a huge, and I don't mind bragging about them because I don't get anything in return. I am a huge fan of a company called Harlem Candle Company um, out of Harlem, New York. They, honestly, they're worth looking at. I suggest everybody check them out because they're branding. It's the best branded company I've come across maybe in my career. Like, it is unbelievable how well branded and I've gotten to know the owner. Her name is Terry Johnson. I've had Terry as a guest on my podcast. I had Terry as a guest on my uh, self-employed summit. It is phenomenally well branded. Everything, the stories Amazing. behind the candles it is, and the scents <laughs> are, the product is unbelievable. So I have, I literally have almost every scent that is even offered. My favorites I tend to like things that are kind of musky and kind of like a lot of her candles have a combination between like tobacco and leather. Like if you can kind of imagine what that would smell like, that's what I like. I like kind of a musky type of smell. Yeah, lovely. Actually, I'm um, just got, it was my birthday recently. I got the new Tom, oh, it's not new, uh, Tom Ford's uh, cherry perfume, which is like oh, wow. Tabasco and cherry. I love, yeah. So nice, uh, nice musky combination. Yeah. But it's true. Like we talk about when we design our face to face workshops, we're always thinking about the space. And I've heard a few facilitators on the show, like use diffusers and candles in the room just to set the energy. And when you do different types of activities, you'll move people around. So it makes sense to do it um, on ourselves as well. You alluded to standing up a lot and obviously energy, um, not only time management, energy management is important for you. So Jeffrey, like I know that you speak on many stages, you do podcasts, you do workshops, like how do you get into state before you jump into these sort of things? Yeah. Um, so a few things Now, one is, so I, I alluded that I live in Miami now. I moved here six years ago from Manhattan, which is where I've spent most of my life. I moved here because of the environment. I came down for three months and never left six years ago. Because one thing I realized is that my life had shifted from being a full-time photographer to doing, you know, now I do very little photography and it's all coaching and writing it's and facilitating. And what I realized is that when you're in a giving profession, as we are as facilitators and coaches, you need, a ref you need an environment that refuels you. And I didn't realize because New York City had the benefit of making you think big and very high standard of quality. And I, I thrived on that until I got away from it and realized that the problem is in a busy life, you never, New York City is never off, mm -hmm. right? Your energy is always on. What I needed was live beside the ocean where I can fly, I can come home, I could be home for 24 hours, refuel and get back out there. So one thing I would say is to be conscious of how your environment and how you live refuels you. Because when you're in a giving profession, you have a reservoir within yourself that needs to be refueled because otherwise you run the risk of draining yourself. Mm -hmm. Just prior to a, uh, a workshop facilitating, <laughs> and I look at even as being a speaker as facilitating, um, I always, you know, first of all, I, I will pump myself up to a degree with music. Like there's a few inspiring songs that I'll have in headphones. It's usually the last thing I do before I walk on stage or out into a room is listen to an inspiring song. Prior to then, I tend to ground myself. For one, I, I wear inspiring socks. I know that sounds crazy, but I yeah. have, I wear socks that have inspiring messages on them. And there's actually a company called Inspire Socks. So um, like probably my favorite pair, uh, one sock says um, heart and the other so sock says value, I think, or something like that. Um, so each sock has a different word on it. So there's, I know that I'm wearing that and that means something to me, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one way I prep for the morning, like as I'm getting dressed, putting those on sets the stage like I and I only wear them I only wear those inspiring socks when I'm facilitating or speaking they're not something I wear on a day-to-day -day basis so immediately I'm cued that this is something special and I want to hold those values uh, I tend to I'm a bit of an introvert so I tend to be nervous stepping out onto the stage or to a workshop so I do most of my breathing I try to bring myself down first like really ground myself one of the things I'm constantly reminding myself is that it's I keep my mantra in my head is this is not about you, mm. right? 
meaning myself, because I have to realize no matter what, particularly on stages, no matter what happens, if the sound goes out, if the lighting goes out, if I fall off the stage, I, when I embody the idea that this is not about me, I will keep going regardless of what happens. I have something to give. I also, you know, the spotlight is on me literally, but I want the spotlight to be on the audience because I want to deflect the attention. So if I, if I embody the idea, the spotlight is me, I'm going to start worrying about my clothes, my hair, right? So I deflect the spotlight so that it's on the people I'm there to serve. Mm. So I kind of go through this mental process and I actually do have a meditation I listened to right before. Um, I'm a big fan of the Calm app. And yes. there is a meditation on there that is preparing for walking out on a stage. Like it's a really good meditation for that. And it kind of shifts your mind. So I, I do everything I can to make the attention to about the audience, bring ground to myself. The very last thing I do is bring my energy up with a song. And then I walk out on stage. Yeah, I love that, con that contrast of energy and, and even the yeah. socks. We need, you need to get affiliate links for the, for the candles and for the socks as well. <laughs> I had um, Dr. JJ Peterson from StoryBrand on and he was talking about like the energy question. He's like, just get a really decent pair of shoes. He's like, spend hundreds of dollars on good shoes. And so it's, it's, it, what I'm hearing is that it's all about just, just convincing yourself and getting yourself and ready, uh, ready so that you can serve the audience. And I also love um, that you brought up that you see keynote speaking as facilitating as well. I, I yeah. could not agree more, particularly in the, yeah, in the virtual landscape. Absolutely. I mean, to me, it's, you know, anytime if I have, a, if I have a, an event planner challenging me on my rate, um, you know, something I'll come back with often is like, it's not the hour and 15 minutes I'm on the stage. It's the 500 souls you're putting in my custody and I care about, right? It totally reframes what oh. they're thinking about when they're thinking, but I, I take that sincerely. It's like, it's not about the hour and 15 minutes. And yes, it is also about the 37 years of experience that got me there. That's certainly a part of it. But the most important reason you're paying me what you're paying me is because it's the 500 souls or 200 souls that are before me for which I'm responsible, not just for their safety, which I take serious as well. Like I have a plan for exit rooms. When I'm, at, when I'm speaking, I know where the exit doors are. Like I'm the way I'm standing with the mic. If I had to get people out of that room, I take that responsibility almost from a parental perspective. Mm. But also it's like, what influence am I going to have over their lives? Where do I want their thoughts to go? What fundamental shift do I want them to experience? I take that responsibility seriously. Mm. And it's for that reason, I think we need to command our greatest value. It's not the time. It is certainly part of the experience that got you there. But I think the most important thing is whether it's 50 people in a room or 500 people in a room, it's the souls that are before you for which you are re responsible for influencing. And that it's cliche, but that is priceless. Absolutely. Thank you for, I've never heard it articulated that way before. The other week, I, I, it was just a one hour, just, it was one hour session, but there were about a hundred people on there. And honestly, like Jeffrey, I felt so exhausted, like so drained afterwards. And I was like, why is that Leanne? Like, come on, like you used to be able to do all these day events. And I think it was because of what you said. It was, I was putting, there was a pressure. I was like, I wanted to create some shift. I wanted to really create uh, some sense of uh, shift within that audience in that space of 60 minutes. And maybe it was the fact that I was the caretaker of those hundred souls for that moment in time. Hundred percent. Because I couldn't figure out any other way, but you just sort of raised yeah. the light on on that. Yeah, that's why it's draining. I mean, I I, I have yeah. uh, an institute. It's called the Self Employed Business Institute, and it is a five month training for self employed business owners. And we do two training calls a month. And I, it's from one to well, usually one to three. We usually end up going about two hours. I cross myself off the rest of the day after three o'clock yeah. because I know how draining it's. Only it's two hours, and there's. 20 people in the cohort, but it's, it is literally giving your all. And that is something, again, I think that's, we overlook as facilitator and coaches and speakers that this is a giving profession. You are pouring everything you've got out and you have to refuel and you have to take care of that. Oh, amazing. This is, this is so good. This is so perfect for our audience and, and very selfish, even for me. <laughs> so that's about you being a podcast host. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Hey, I want to I just I want to ask you about this activity um, before we close the interview. Um, something that you do, and I thought this would be a great activity for a workshop. You you say is you gather a small group together, and it's called the you create an up it list. Yeah. So you get one person. Can you share that activity with, with our listeners? Yeah, it was. 
Oh gosh, I'm trying. I wish I could. I had to. I had to think further what the root of it was. But if, like a lot of things, like you had just said, a lot of times it's like something we need, and we wind up creating something for others out of it. <laughs> but the idea of the up it list, actually, now that I'm thinking it through, it actually. I know what it was. I know how I created this. So my TEDx talk, uh, the theme of my TEDx talk, the, over, the overriding theme, is that often other people see more in us than we see in ourselves. Okay, so that's the overall, I had an organization contact me to do a workshop for them. And the event planner was a big fan of my TEDx talk. And he asked me to do an exercise around my TEDx talk. So that was the challenge before me. It's like, well, how, what kind of exercise do I do that represents often other people see more in us than we see in ourselves? So I came with this idea of an up it list and the way it worked and works and the way I did it in this workshop is um, in this case, I had people broken up in, in triads. So there were three in a group and there were multiple groups of three. So one person, let's say person A would, would be the first one to go and would say, just state a goal. Say, I, I'll actually use a real example because I remember one of uh, the people in the group said that uh, her goal was to speak at 50 events that year. And some the other people listening has a, have reflected. So first thing you want to do is you want to repeat back what that person said so they feel heard. It's like, okay, I hear you. You want to speak at 50 events this year. Well, I see you showing up at 25 of those events first class. Oh. Right? And then, and of course the person receiving it is like, oh, you just upped it. And then somebody else says, I see you showing up at two of those events on a private corporate jet. Right? And then it bounces. Mm -hmm. And then the other person said, actually, I see you doing 60 events next year, right? So it gets, and it's, the point is for it not to be so extreme, it's ridiculous. Like I see you making $5 million this year. Like you, <laughs> you want to, you know, you got to keep it in the realm, but do you know what? I mean, and I remember this, I remember getting the message from her at a later point, she goes, you're not going to believe how many times my flight has been upgraded this year since we did that exercise, <laughs> right? And it's just, it's it, the up it list. Like, it's just that it's, it's to lean on other people to increase what you think you're capable of, mm -hmm. what you think is going to happen in your life. That's what's called an up it list. And it's just then, you know, if you're here to try it, then the next person goes and you just give everybody a chance to state a goal and then let the other people reflect back to you what they hear and how they can imagine it being bigger than you're even thinking of for yourself. Yeah. I love how bigger isn't like do a hundred events. It's like the style that you're showing up with, like the ease at which you're booking these gigs. I just got goosebumps. I think that's a wonderful activity. I think many of us could use it in Zoom and breakout rooms. And, and thank you so much for sharing that in your book sure. um, and the origins on this show. Jeffrey, uh, you're awesome. Um, you've got so many <laughs> recommendations, uh, places to find you. Where can we send people that like to ask you questions, find out more, just see the amazing work that you do? Sure. Well, assuming with your audience that probably most of them are, well, I think you had said 50% of them internal and 50% are uh, self-employed, but I, I think there's, I think the most successful people within companies are self-employed minded, right? Even if they're not working, but there's a certain independence of way of thinking. So with that in mind, I'd probably suggest go to the selfemployedlife.me, uh, which is a part of my main website, but it's the selfemployed.me excuse me, the self-employed life.me. It's literally my, the world I've created for self-employed people. It is where my book, The Self-Employed Life appears. It is where training opportunities are. It's where all my resources, the articles I write, anything that will help you if you are a self-employed business owner or if you're working for a company, but you are of that independent self-employed minded person, I think that's the world to go. It is, like I said, it's part of my main website. So then you can peck around. You can go to all the other pages and find my socials and contacts, et cetera. Amazing. And I think everyone listening on the show absolutely has a self-employed mindset. They're all after their personal development and growing right. themselves. So it's yeah. the perfect site for them. Jeffrey, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yay.